My name is John Wang. I've been involved in the information technology industry for over 30 years. And in the last 15 years, I have been an information security consultant. I'm also a professor at George Brown College, teaching in their cybersecurity program. Specifically, what I teach in is in data governance and information security, which is the subject of what we're going to talk about today. So before we begin, let me go to our first slide in which we'll provide some definitions. And those definitions is data governance and what is data governance? Well, that is about management of data and everything involved revolving around the management of data and the capability of an organization to ensure high quality data throughout the complete cycle from the creation, the use, and finally the retirement of that data. Next is what is information security? Information security is a subset of quality. It is about how do you protect information and information systems from unauthorized access, use, disruption, modification, destruction in order to provide proper levels of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The next definition I want to talk about is cybersecurity. And cybersecurity is actually a subset of information security that involves specifically about electronic data as opposed to data that happens to be physically on something like a piece of paper. And cybersecurity is the art of protecting networks, devices, and data from unauthorized access, criminal use, or the practice of ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You notice that I'm repeating these words, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, again, because those three words, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, are the core concepts of information security and cybersecurity. What is confidentiality? Confidentiality is protecting yourself or protecting data from the harm of having that data leaked out to people who are not authorized to view that data. What is data integrity? Data integrity is ensuring that the data is not corrupt. The data is accurate, the data is timely, and the data is complete. Next is availability, the availability of data. And what is that? That means that the availability, data is available to authorize people when they need it, where they need it, and in the format that they need it. So we have just talked about the very basic concepts of information governance and the very, very, some very basic definitions relating to information security. Our next slide, we want to talk about how to incorporate incorporate security into data governance. The things that you need to do to ensure that security is embedded into data governance is three things. Number one, inventory your informational assets. What does that mean? What that means is if you don't know what kinds of information you have in your environment, in your organization, in your, in your systems, you can't protect them. You can't protect things you don't know even exist. So one of the key elements is you need to understand what types of information are there in your organization. 
once you know that, then you can classify that information. And we'll talk about classification in number three, determining the appropriate security controls based on the classification levels as we walk through this presentation. So we've talked about number one, which is making sure you know all the information assets in your system, because if you don't know that, you, you don't know that you need to protect them. And how do you properly protect information? The first thing you need to determine is classification. There are many, many different ways in which you can classify informational assets. And each organization may have their own methodology. I'm going to present a one an example of a methodology to classify information, but that isn't the meth necessarily be the methodology that you may use in your organization. Every organization does it differently. So on to our next slide, which is data classification based on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the slide that you he see here is the slide that relates to the level of injury. And this is the way that the Canadian government does it. This is part of a methodology used by DRCMP, uh, Communication Securities Establishment, called the Harm Knife Threat, Threat Risk Assessment Methodology. And there, in that methodology, it classifies data based on the level of injury, the level of harm. So the way that we would use this table is as follows. First, we look at a piece of informational asset and say, if that information got leaked out, how much harm could it bring to the organization? either from physical harm, which you can see from that column physical, it could cause psychological damage to a group of people, but how much psychological damage could it occur? You look at this, the column under psychological, and the third is if that got leaked out and it caused financial impact, how much impact could it cause? And that's the final column, which is financial impact. You would ask the same question all over again, but looking at it from a data integrity perspective, saying that if this data got corrupted, how much physical damage would it cause? How much psychological damage does, would it cause? What would be the financial impact by the, that information being corrupted? Lastly, we would look at it from an availability perspective. If that information simply was not available, there was a disruption to your information system, disruption to your computer system, and people weren't authorized people weren't able to access that information in a timely manner. How much physical harm could that cause? How much psychological harm could that cause? How, what, how big a financial impact would it be? That being said, let's take an example. So an example of an informational asset would be our next slide. And this is a slide that comes from the Government of Canada's website. And this is uh, about short-term drinking water advisory in Aboriginal communities. And you can see within each of the columns, you will see what the, the columns are. The first column is First Nation community. So what is the uh, name of that First Nation, in what community does that, does that First Nation reside in? The third column is water system. So the name of the water system that supplies water 
to that particular community in which that First Nations um, resides in. The third is the type of advisory, and there are three types. A boil water advisory, which means that if you're able to boil the water, then you can cons consume it. A do not consume advisory means don't drink the water regardless of whether you boil it or not. Do not drink the water. You can still do things like bathe in it, but don't, don't consume it inside. The third advisory is do not use advisory, which is the most serious one. And that is don't use the water at all to do anything. So those are the three types of advisory. The next is the date in which that advisory was set. So the date in which the advisory was put in place. And if that advisory is ongoing, or if, if the advisory ended, the date in which that advisory ended was the date that it was revoked. And the last one is the population size, which is how large a population size does that particular advisory affect? So this is an example of an informational asset, this set of data that you see here. So how do, would we classify something like this? That, this is where I would go on to our next slide. which is the classification of this piece of data that we've just talked about. First of all, let's take a look at it from a confidentiality perspective. Well, because this is public information, this is information that needs to be out there in front of the public. It has to be out there, so the confidentiality level is very low, it's public information. Next is data integrity. What if this data was incorrect? What could happen? Well, if you got the community wrong, if you said it was in, the boil water advisory was in, supposed to be in one community, but you posted it in another community, then people in the community in which it should have been posted with would still be drinking their water without boiling it and they would get sick. So we certainly have concerns about the integrity of the data. We would also have concerns if that data was not available, if people could not see this data. So if you weren't aware that, because it wasn't posted on this website, you weren't aware that there was a boil water advisory in your community, you would continue to drink water in which you shouldn't be doing so. So certainly we have concerns about data integrity and data availability of this type of data for this particular example. But how serious could it be? Well, we can look back at history. And one of the most famous examples in Ontario is the incident in Walkerton in May 2000, in which E. coli contaminated the, the drinking water in the community of Walkerton. And the outcome of that is at least six people died over 2,000 people got sick from E. coli. 22 children got permanent kidney damage. And a report out of the Walkerton Inquiry estimated that the cost to contain this contamination ran from between $64 million to $155 million. So based on that, and based on the injury tests that I had shown you a couple of slides ago, we would say the integrity is high because there's some potential of some loss of life for some, at least six deaths, potential disability for some, 
22 children got permanent kidney damage. Serious injury or illness for many. So in Walkerton, over 2,000 people got sick. And the financial impact was over $10 million, but under a billion dollars, which falls into the high category since the containment cost was somewhere between 64 million and 155 million. A similar analysis comes to a similar conclusion as it relates to the availability of data. So both the integrity of the data is high and the availability of the data is high based on my interpretation of the injury test table and my and this example that's coming out of Walkerton. So now that we've determined that we're not really that concerned about confidentiality of the information, but we are concerned about protecting the integrity and availability of the information, how do we do so? Well, that goes on to our next slide, which is controls relevant to the classification. As I mentioned, this is public information. So I'm not concerned about protecting the information from the confidentiality. I'm not concerned about having that, any putting in controls to prevent the information from being leaked out. I want to ensure that there are sufficient controls to protect the integrity of data. And how do I do so? There are a number of types of controls that I can put into place, which can be things like in, on this website, when you're, I, am I typing in the input into, onto this website or any particular system that feeds information into this website that there's input validation? What that means is that as the information flows into the website, the web, there's programming, there's code in the website that says, does this information that's coming in make sense? Is, is the way that the information formatted make sense? If it's, if it's about a dollar value, then there should be some dollar signs in front of that, in front of that information. Is the range of, range make sense? So if we're talking about, let's say, First Nations communities, I wouldn't expect a First Nations community to be over, let's say, 10 million people. So if I come into a population size of 24 million, hmm, that may be something that would be a little bit suspect and I may want to check out to say, is that information truly valid? Similarly, as the information comes out, output validation, as the information is being presented onto the website, does that information make sense? The whole process of doing reviews of water quality sampling, all that process of ensuring that that backend processes before that information ever gets onto the website, make sure that those processes include formal review and validation before it ever gets posted is certainly something that needs to be taken into consideration, as well as authentication. So who is allowed to go onto the website to make changes? And do you have sufficient authentication controls? Is if I have a simple username with, let's say, a five-character password to be able to go in and change it, somebody may be able to hack into this website and try to guess what the appropriate password would be and without proper authority, change it. So to have strong authentication mechanisms such as multi-factor authentication using more than just a password, but a password and something else, something else such as um, a one-time code that is sent to the person's cell phone, 
would be a second factor as part of multi-factor authentication. Making sure that the people who are able to change these, the information on this website, make sure that only those people who are authorized to do the changes have the privileges on a website to do so. So those are examples of controls that you may want to consider to protect the integrity of the data of this website. Next, we look at availability controls, making sure this website is available when people who need to see it are able to see it. One of the things you want to do is have this website have redundant systems on this website so that if the main system that's running this website goes down, becomes unavailable, is disrupted, you have a backup system that it can almost instantaneously switch over to the backup system to continue to provide such information to the people who need to see it. If the worst case scenario happens and there's a disaster within the data center in where you you're running your website, do you have a disaster recovery plan? Do you have a way to ensure that you have a backup data center and a way of moving your IT operations to that backup data center? As well, because this information needs to go onto this website in a timely manner, make sure the processes that you have in place from the process of sampling the data to the time in which that data, you recognize that a boil water advisory needs to be issued to the time that that information gets posted onto the website is done in a timely manner so that there isn't any unnecessarily unnecessary delays before that information is posted. So those are some of the th controls that you may consider to ensure that that information is available to people who need to see it in a timely manner. So to recap, in order to ensure that you embed information security into data governance, you need to do three things. First of all, inventory your informational assets. Make sure you know all the informational assets that is within your domain. Second, classify the, your assets. Classify it based on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And once you do so, you then go on and apply the proper and appropriate security controls based on the classification of the data that you have done. And that is how you incorporate information security into data governance. Thank you.